Hey, everybody, we got a great one today without a monologue, you know, for a change. Let me explain. I just taped my conversation with Daniel Goldman. You probably know Daniel from CNN or MSNBC. He uh, was chief counsel to the House managers in the first impeachment. Uh, he was uh, worked in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of, of New York. He helped be convicted, the head of the Genovese family. Brilliant, brilliant guy. He's been brilliant on these hearings. I, I found a window where I could interview him. That's what you're going to hear. We, uh, it, it, he's terrific. You're going to really, really get a lot out of this podcast, you know, for once, for once. Daniel, thank you uh, for joining me. I, I'm a big fan of yours. Did you work for the Judiciary Committee in the House? Is that where you the Intelligence like, Committee? Counsel? Intelligence yeah. Committee. Okay, with Schiff. Yep. Uh, so I've been watching every bit of the hearings, and right now uh, the hearings are still going on. So thank you for indulging me. This is the time we could do this. Pretty amazing, huh? <laughs> it's pretty wild. Uh, I, I, it feels like all my worlds are colliding here as we have these high stakes congressional hearings with senior DOJ officials. And I've done both. I've been, was in the DOJ for 10 years and listening to what Donald Trump and Mark Meadows and Jeffrey Clark tried to do with the department of justice uh, is the greatest attack on the department of justice that I think I've ever heard. Uh, It is just truly remarkable what, what they're describing. And insanely stupid. Uh, I love that they wanted to pursue the uh, Italy thing that uh, satellites in Italy are changing the votes. <laughs> the, the only thing, the only thing dumber than that is that Hugo Chavez was resurrected in order to from Venezuela in order to change the votes. I still think that one takes. No, the no, I will defend that. I mean, I think they just said that he developed that technology or something. Um, um, right. I, I don't think they said he was resurrected. Let's defend. You know, let's not go overboard here. <laughs> you uh, clearly have been, uh, you're in the Justice Department. You're, I, I, I'm not a lawyer. I was on the Judiciary Committee. I uh, played a lawyer in a sketch. But, exactly. And, and in all, the Senate. And in the Senate. Well, I played a, a member of the Judiciary Committee. I have been saying this all along, which is that I don't understand why there's any issue about prosecuting him. It seems like every bit of information that we've been hearing it, it just points to, yeah, he was leading a conspiracy to overturn the Democratic election. I, I, I don't get it. I can explain. I, let me just first say I agree with you. And I think these hearings and presenting this evidence has just cemented that view even more. I, I can play devil's advocate here, as you know, lawyers do. The best defense that Donald Trump could muster would be an advice of counsel defense that Rudy Giuliani and John Eastman are well-respected lawyers who were advising him that what he was pursuing in order to challenge the election were legitimate pursuits. And even though we can sit here and we can say, well, it's obviously bogus, Giuliani is off his rocker and John Eastman is you know, out in some conspiracy world, Donald Trump would say, I'm not a lawyer. They're lawyers. They're telling me it's okay. And who am I to decide that they're wrong and, you know, the the Department of Justice lawyers are right or Pat Cipollone's right or Eric Hirschman is right? I mean, these are what they, these guys are telling me this. They're telling me that. I chose to believe these guys. I didn't think I was actually committing a crime. I don't know what you think of that defense. I think it's incredibly lame, but uh, you're you're you went to law school. Go ahead. Well, Keep no, I mean, I, I I think ultimately you would you could take it down. Um, I let mean, me I hear. Let me a, hear how you would take that down. You set it up. Let me. Let me I'll let you take it down. Well, he was um, because he's putting his head in the sand, and so many different times he was asked, and Giuliani was asked, and Eastman were asked to pre- present evidence of the fraud. And they never could. And every single time he spoke to anyone, whether it was the Department of Justice or Brad Raffensperger or any or or even his own attorneys in the White House, they had done an investigation and they had found that there was no fraud. 
I mean, Bill Barr said that very early of on. Of course, he's told over and over again. And so, you know, you, you've got two different paths to this. First of all, it's just not reasonable to choose to believe these conspiracies because, you know, Giuliani and I would charge Giuliani and Eastman too. They were all part of a conspiracy. Yeah. But then the second and independent parts of it is Donald Trump's own words. And that's really where he can't defend. Because in at least two instances, and I think this, the hearings have demonstrated that there are other, there's other additional context to, in, to support this. But he said in, uh, in the call with Brad Raffensperger to find me the votes, the 11,780 votes, exactly, which is one more than he needed. Okay. He wasn't yep. saying, you know, oh, do, look into this and figure out whether or not uh, there was any election fraud. He bears very specifically. And he threatens for, him. And he and threatens, he threatens him, him saying, if you don't do this, you could be in real big trouble. And then the other thing is what we heard today in, in great detail, which is that he told the senior leadership of the Department of Justice after they seri- serially rebutted all of the allegations with their own investigative findings, which showed that they were all bogus. Then at the end of that conversation, he says, we'll just say it's corrupt and the Republican congressman and I will take care of the rest. He just wanted them to say it, even though he knew that the facts did not support it. And when you put those two things together, you very clearly learn, as well as all the other evidence, and this is a mosaic, there's no smoking gun here, but you put it all together and you can pretty clearly see that he understood that what he was trying to do was illegal and that he was ultimately trying to find some means to coerce or push other people to acquiesce to his illegal actions. And that's why you have so many different steps. Is He kept running into problems at every single step of the way. And that's why it ultimately culminated on January 6th, you know, when he rallied everyone to Washington and then incited their attack on the Capitol. You know, you say it's a mosaic. There's not one smoking gun. But if you pull back from the mosaic, it's a mosaic of a smoking gun. Right. <laughs> right. It's like an impressionistic painting. Yes. You can't listen to this without concluding. Of course, he knew that he didn't win by a landslide. Remember in the Raffensburger call, he says, I won by 400,000 votes. Yeah. Now, insanity. That seems to be his best defense. But let me, what is the, uh, what is the principle when you can prosecute someone who just refuses to hear the truth? What's it called? Yeah. Is there, what's that principle? Conscious avoidance or willful ignorance. <laughs> well, uh, conscious avoidance, then willful. I mean, that's, that's there. Yeah. My Otherwise God. known as putting your head in the sand. So you don't hear the, you know, the bad stuff. Um, and that's, that's exactly right. And I would, you know, I would support any assertion that he he had to have known any reasonable person would have known that what he was doing was illegal. And to the extent that he claims he was not aware, it's because he intentionally avoided learning. And that's what the willful ignorance says. And, you know, we know this guy, right? We've seen him. We, we know who he is. He's just a sick guy. And he just wanted to keep power. And that's what this is about, right? Yeah. And look, it goes back to the first impeachment that I did. He didn't actually want You were Zelensky. the chief counsel to the uh, managers, to the uh, house uh, managers of the impeachment? Yeah, I, le- I was the lead counsel for the investigation lead, yeah. and yeah. then the uh, chief counsel for the managers ah. uh, for the Senate uh, trial. And what we found pretty clearly was that Donald Trump didn't care if Ukraine actually did the investigations of Biden and Burisma. He just wanted them to say that they were doing it so that he could use that as a rallying cry like he did with Hillary Clinton's emails in 2016. And that didn't work out for him, but that's exactly his MO. That's what he wanted the Department of Justice to do. He just wanted them to say it was corrupt and then he could go and use that from his pulpit to, you know, convince his own supporters and potentially convince 
other Republican state legislators who, you know, might be able to decertify and recertify and send it to the House and, you know, the, the very complicated constitutional process that would ensue. But this is Donald Trump's MO. It's also, by the way, uh, his MO to incite violence. He doesn't say, please go, you know, use violence. But every time he has said anything negative about anyone dating back to the whistleblower and Alexander Vindman, uh, they were suffered tremendous threats and threats of violence. Remember at, at his rally, uh, rallies in 2016 or one rally, he said, I'll pay if you beat somebody, uh, one of these protesters up, I'll pay for your legal fees. Exactly. exactly. I mean, that's pretty bad. I mean, that's <laughs> we know who this guy is. He is a, uh, a, a wannabe mob boss. Or he's a mob boss, I think. Um, <laughs> he was a mob boss on the Raffensperger call. Can you imagine, by the way, I've, I've said this before, what if Raffensperger had done what Trump had said, what Raffensperger's press conference would have been like? It would have been like, yeah. um, uh, I'm <clears throat> Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State here uh, in Georgia, and uh, <clears throat> there's been a change in the tally in the presidential election and the winner by one vote one vote <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Donald Trump. exactly i mean that's what trump wanted him to do it's yeah, but you, raise, you raise another important point which is that the institutions held but barely and adam schiff said this i think so eloquently on tuesday in tuesday's hearings the institution the doj held brad raffensperger georgia held arizona rusty bowers they held but, but only barely I mean, we were very, Mike Pence held, you know, but everybody looked into this pretty intensively and there was serious consideration for doing what Donald Trump was asking. So it's not out of the question that, you know, we would have been in that unbelievable constitutional crisis. And it's certainly not out of the question now looking forward that it will happen again because Donald Trump's still at it. And Republican state legislators have changed, the legislatures have changed the laws yep. to allow for elected officials to have a much more significant role in certifying the results in the states. And they are paving the way to correct the errors of 2020 in 2024. This is what Ludwig was, or Ludwig, uh, was talking about, which is Trump and his followers uh, present a clear and present danger. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Because they're not, it's not like they're sitting there saying, oh, you know, I didn't realize that this was so illegal and this was so bad. You know, now I understand it. All right, let's get back to normal here. No, he's out there perpetrating, pushing the big lie still. Oh, and, and, and a large percentage of Republicans still believe it. Now, we're probably seeing in the polling some movement in terms of uh, people kind of going, hmm. This, uh, I would say, independents more than Republicans, but some Republicans who are going like, yeah, boy, <laughs> uh, yeah. He, he needs <laughs> this. Is, this is this is what it was. Right. No, I think that's right. But we don't know if that's enough. We don't know if it's enough. And, uh, you know, I, I have counted him out ever since uh, he said that he likes people who weren't captured. Yeah, well, exactly. He prefers people with bone spurs. Yeah, well, he. uh those must have been very painful. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had them. I haven't. Uh, but I, I had a 2S deferment. This has exceeded all my expectations, this presentation. Yes. It, and, and it's cumulative. What's next after this? They, they are, is Cipollone going to, should he? I think he should, right? Testify. Well, he definitely should. Uh, yeah. It's clear that he has not agreed to do it yet. Um, we are. I am sure we are going to have a hearing on what Donald Trump was doing on January sixth, and what the gap in the phone calls was. Uh, his phone calls records were from what he was doing on January sixth. Let's remember he waited over three hours to send a tape, a video saying, "Get out." You know, I love you, but you sh should leave. During that three hours plus the Capitol Police were fighting thousand people. And he was watching. Yeah, he was enjoying it. So 
the fact that he allowed that to happen is such a dereliction of duty uh, that it's it's just stunning. And people got killed because of it. And, and you know, what I would like to see, I, I hear that they made other tapes. In other words, he tr- they, they had him videotape something, but it, they went, no, Mr. President, you can't say that or something. Yeah, have I you heard they that? Have the, uh-huh, I've heard the, that they had outtakes. I would love uh, to and- see those. And that they were they were they were too inflammatory. Exactly, I'd love to see at what was it four seventeen or something that that thing finally went out. I mean his his tweet about Mike Pence was at two twenty four. Mike Pence had already been ushered out of the Senate because of the invading or insurrectionists, and he still tweeted at two twenty four just to ra- you know to galvanize and incite the crowd even further about Mike Pence. It's un, it's unconscionable what he did. It is absolutely unconscionable that any person, much less the president of the United States, would do what he did. It's, it's amazing that the worst person in the world became the president of the United States. I mean, <laughs> what are the chances of that? The thing about this is that nothing has shocked me, Right. I've been watching this. I've been, you know, I, uh, some of the stuff is so so bad that I, I've laughed, but nothing has shocked me, and nothing would shock me if we, we heard in hearing a, a witness just being asked, "Did the did the president ask you to draw up the gallows?" Uh, yes, I, he did. About ten days before January sixth, he wanted a sketch of the gallows. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't. Yeah. Would that, would that surprise you? <laughs> would it surprise you if like uh, when the president heard that, was there any time during the day where he danced the jig? Yes. Uh, there was a misreport that the uh, vice president had uh, been apprehended by the crowd and torn limb to limb. And he danced it. That's when he danced. I don't know what the definition of a, a jig is. Uh, congressman, but um, it was a celebratory dance of some sort. I mean, would that <laughs> shock you? <laughs> no. <laughs> It'd be like, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's bad. And then uh, should we prosecute him? No. <laughs> I, I hear you. I hear you. I mean, what we used to say, you know, with Adam Schiff and we were in the intelligence committee and we would learn, you know, about some of his crazy statements or, or whatever it was, you know, which just progressively over the four years got more and more insane and extreme, we would look at each other and say, it is shocking, but not surprising. And nothing would surprise me, but it still does shock me that this stuff goes on. I mean, I think what they just recounted in the hearings is all of the different congressmen who went to Trump to try to get pardons before he left. We want a list of those, don't we? Yeah, I think they they gave a bunch. Uh, Gomer, Scott Perry, Mo Brooks, I think, asked. Gates, uh, there was a slew of folks. Well, Gates might have asked for for an overall pardon for other reasons. Yes, exactly. So there's that. There's that. So, you know, you can let him off on on just on the plotting, the... Right. You can let him <laughs> off on, on just being a potential sex trafficker. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's opera. why I asked for a pardon. Uh, of course. It Not because, because I was plotting to over, you know, overturn the election. Give me a break. No, no, no. It was. <laughs> and by the way, Gates is on the Judiciary Committee, which oversees the Department of Justice while under investigation by the Department of Justice. But that's an aside. I. I you know, uh, I have some strong opinions on this. <laughs> so, uh, what's going forward? Uh, what, what are we seeing? What's the next one? Now they delayed the next one. Are you think they're getting people coming forward who weren't coming forward before? Is that what's going on? It's hard to know. I mean, they have indicated that people are coming forward. I think the, a couple of things are likely going on right now. One is they're continuing to be in negotiations with Cipollone. Um, and perhaps some other witnesses that they would like to have who have not fully agreed to do it. And there could be some scheduling issues with them. Um, There's also going to be the Dobbs opinion next week, uh, which is going to be pretty consuming for the the public. Uh, And so it's very likely that they... That's Mississippi. That's exactly. That's the uh, the the abortion. abortion case. Um, and my suspicion is they don't want to have these hearings. Uh, wow, for, that's, yeah. 
yeah well after shortly after that drops um and people are understandably irate so and and they'll want to focus on that so i assume it's you know one or both you know combination um but it's also i think what they probably realize is that the public has reacted those that have seen it seen them have reacted very positively and it's having a pretty significant impact because they've done such a nice job of really concisely and powerfully presenting the various aspects of the scheme and i think they're they may be considering you know this has been going so well let's keep you know putting out different hearings on different specific aspects of it and that as a former staffer who has prepared for these hearings it takes an inordinate amount of time the presentation value of these hearings is incredible and it takes uh dozens and dozens of hours to put them together and and very impressively done and they had a, a producer or news exec from abc mm -hmm. and i think that has been very helpful each one of these is very efficient and laid out pretty powerfully i agree i mean the the real I think the biggest reason why they we've been able to get you know such a good understanding of what happened in the presentation has been so good is there's no minority here. There's no Republican side that you need to alternate five minutes, five minutes. It is one committee that is bipartisan, but they're all working in unison. And so they've all agreed to have the hearings just simply, as they want them. There's no one objecting to the schedule or the video or an equal time or anything like that. And there's no one obstructing and distracting and obfuscating and trying to interrupt as, you know, we had in Jim certainly Jordan. in our hearings. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, and, and so the fact that they have two, two and a half hours to do whatever they want with it gives them a lot of leeway and they've taken that opportunity and done just a magnificent job. Yeah, now I hear people are, you know, uh, Republicans are complaining that McCarthy didn't put some Republicans on. Let me ask you if you remember this, because you were there. I mean, well, you were obviously in the Senate and this was the House. But I, I remember vaguely hearing that there were some rumblings with the Benghazi committee about Democrats boycotting it. and ultimately they decided that it was better to have a voice in the room than boycott it. That makes sense. I was not, you know, dare I say the house, <laughs> uh, but you would, I, you would never stoop so low. No, no, no. I, I, uh, but that was amazing. That been, what was it? 11 hours. Yeah. And you know, the worst part was uh, toward the end, uh, one of the Republicans made her do chin ups while answering. <laughs> I thought that was terrible. And she did it. And she yeah, did it. and she did it with one hand because she had to read stuff uh, while she was. So, so she's amazing. The other thing that we haven't talked about, I'm curious your, your view of this. I think another aspect of these hearings that have been so powerful is that, save for Shea Ross, the, you know, uh, Moss, Georgia. Yeah. Shea Moss, sorry. The Georgia. Oh, my gosh. Um, uh, voting, you know, civilian, civil servant, been all um, Republicans, every single witness has been Republican and either a Trump appointee, a Trump official or another Republican. And so the notion, and we're not even hearing it, the notion that this is a partisan witch hunt just dies because there, you know, as with all investigations, and I would say this back at the time about our Ukraine investigation, as with all investigations, it all depends on what the witnesses testify. The questioners are not the witnesses. They were not there. They don't have any information other than what the witnesses tell them. And every single one of these witnesses painting this devastating story against Donald Trump were many were his own employees, his own officials, his own appointees, uh, and all were Republican. But kind of remember that uh, all of them are test who are testifying now could have come out and said something uh for, for for example even if not before january 6th after january 6th to the, for the impeachment because mm -hmm. uh the impeachment was about making sure he doesn't can't run for office again 
That's right. And, and you raise a very good point. So I don't really think of these people necessarily as heroes at all. I just think they kind of had to do this. Or they had to testify and then, or they, they had to, right. They were subpoenaed or, or asked to, to give testimony. And then, uh, then now I've done it publicly, but I just, and I think Pence testify. I think, tell me what Cipollone's, uh, uh, case, uh, what, what he's saying, why he doesn't have to testify. You know, we don't really know. Um, uh-huh. uh, the only thing I've read is that he's resisting. I would assume, and this is pure speculation, you know, that he would fall back on both executive privilege and attorney client privilege. Is, is he though his attorney? He, he's, no. I, oh, is he? Well, no, you raise a good point. I mean, he's the White House counsel. He's not his personal attorney. But I believe their attorney-client privilege would would apply. But does it apply with everybody else who is his attorney who's testifying, right? I mean, and what about also, the guys Cipollone who testified today? Speak. Yeah. Well, they, they wouldn't have attorney-client privilege as Department of Justice attorneys. Oh, okay. But the White House counsel, I thought the White House counsel is not his attorney. I thought it was... It is the White House's attorney. I think mm-hmm. it's a murky area. Okay. Um, but certainly he would have executive privilege uh, claims. However, he already gave information. He waived everything because he already provided information. I don't think he provided a transcribed testimony, but certainly if he's right. going to provide information, then he would waive you know, those claims. So I really don't know what the rationale is. Yeah, and that privilege doesn't hold for things that are illegal. Of course, but you would have to, you know, this is why the executive privilege, and this is one of the things that I worked on when before I left, and that is included in the Protecting Our Democracy Act. You know, Donald Trump, of course, has used executive privilege as both a sword and a shield, and he will say, uh, I am reserving the right to assert executive privilege. And it is not up to anyone who over whom he's reserving that right to ultimately make the decision as to whether or not executive privilege applies. It would have to be a neutral court to do that. But that, of course, takes too long. Right. And so in the law that we passed, it was to expedite review in the courts of the executive privilege because he used it uh, so freely and wantonly. Let's talk about your you're bringing up ticking clock here and. You know, where is Garland? Where is the Justice Department? How, when can, is this going to bleed over past uh, the midterm and Definitely. maybe, and, and then maybe into 24 cycle somehow? Well, I mean, the, the problem <laughs> that we end up running into is, you know, the 24 cycle starts in January of 23. Of course. Uh, I yeah, don't know right. when you would say that the cycle begins. Yeah, there is there's no chance, though, that um, they would charge before this upcoming election. I mean, you can just tell by the fact that they're asking for transcripts from the select committee that they would have to then do their own interviews of all those witnesses. It will take a long time. Uh, I am I am my best estimate is that they will reach a decision in April, May of next year, and that that will be their target period. It's, you know, still a year and a half before the election. And mm-hmm. it gives it gives them almost a year from now to build their case. And everybody gets frustrated. And I certainly understand the frustration. But even as you know, we talk about the mosaic of intent that you have to prove, there are so many different witnesses that would contribute to that mosaic. And even if you have enough, you still need to know what everybody else says, because you need to know whether some, you know, the a defense attorney would interview all those people. Maybe they'll be defense witnesses. Maybe they will say something contradictory. And so you can't just say, all right, we've got enough on intent. Let's just go. You have to really know the full story and know what everyone involved is going to say. And there are hundreds of witnesses. This is a massive, sprawling investigation. And as frustrating as it is for all of us who want to see accountability, and the real accountability will come from the Department of Justice, it, we, we just have to be patient because they have to be able to do their job, which because of the massive nature of this scheme is going to take a long time. 
Okay, but there is a prosecutor, Fulton County prosecutor in Georgia, who has a grand jury and has been looking at the Raffensperger tape, which I just don't understand anything other than that he's guilty, right? (laughs) I just don't understand how you listen to that and just go, okay. And that's a federal crime, isn't it? As well as being Well, it's a a state crime. But isn't it also a federal crime? I mean, it's interfering with the federal election. Isn't that a federal crime? Yeah, I mean, you would charge it as a conspiracy to impair the lawful functioning of the government, um, which is the same charge that Mueller used against the two different groups of Russians who use social media and uh, misinformation to interfere in the election and who also hacked. That, that's, into- the, that's the charge, because what's, what's, her, uh, what's the charge going to be for her? Although she's there's going a state wider. law. Yeah. There's a state law that, that, I mean, there's the state RICO law down there is one option. And then there's also a state law. RICO is like a racket. Uh, racketeering, exactly. Yeah. It's like what, what originally was created to. For the mob. For the mob. And, you know, is very applicable to Donald Trump. Because yeah, all I want you to do is find 11,708 votes. Exactly. And, and he says, find. He says, fine. Now, could you could you sit there and argue about what find means? <laughs> you probably could. And is it beyond a reasonable doubt? You know, I mean, look, no, no, I agree with you. But it's, <laughs> it is, you know, you need you, you know, and Raffensperger's testimony was pretty persuasive. And I, I bet there's more there even that we don't know. Lindsey Graham was involved in that one. Um, there's there's plenty more to investigate with that. How, how can how can a prosecutor not use with that tape committing a crime on audio how 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 can you not get a conviction with that i just don't get it 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 just seems impossible the evidence that's been created during this that it was a conspiracy to overturn an election that he led yeah look he he would point to you know any number of different things he said where he was pursuing allegations and that it was yeah he, but he, he he was told they were bullshit over and over again over and over again of and course. then and then he says, just find me the votes. I, I don't disagree with you. And I think that it is a, a pretty persuasive case. I, I just don't think it belongs with the Fulton County DA. I think that it should be swept into the Department of Justice's investigation. That's kind of what that I was it, saying. And- yeah. And that it is a part of the broader scheme and it needs to be viewed that way because it's much more persuasive and much more powerful. And you would want, in order to prove that case, you'd want to have to prove you know, his coercion of the Arizona leg, uh, legislators yeah, that, and the Michigan that guy was folks amazing. Rusty Bowers. Yeah. And then, and then he says he'd still vote for Trump if he was the nominee against Biden, which I can't, that's crazy. I don't yeah. understand that. And I was, you know, that guy was crying. I mean, I saw him tears standing in his eyes, eyes turning red. I mean, uh, but uh, Clark. Okay. Uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Clark. The, uh, <laughs> Uh, that's he's criminal. That's a crime, right? <laughs> Isn't that? Is he in trouble? Oh, he's in big trouble. There was a <laughs> search warrant executed on his house today, which you would need to show a judge that there's probable cause to believe that there's evidence of a crime where they searched. And although that is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt, you have to make a significant showing that there's evidence that he committed a crime. If I'm Jeffrey Clark. Uh, and I think he represented himself the first time, I might get a lawyer and I might go trot into the DOJ and start cooperating because they're coming after me. And, you know, the earlier you get in, the better. Because if John Eastman cooperates or you get others who will, this other lawyer we learned about today who was installed by... Oh, that guy, Klikowski or something? (laughs) Yeah. You know, if he starts cooperating... And he very, he very well may be cooperating. Who knows? I mean, maybe that's the evidence that they got. I'm, this is pure speculation. I don't know anything. Don't go wild on Twitter on it. But, you know, it, it, that's how these things work. Is, right. You know, you get lower level people who witnessed criminal activity. They then cooperate partially to save their own hide, because if they witnessed it, they probably have some degree of exposure to whatever the crime was. And they cooperate and then you get someone else and now you got work your way up. And if Jeffrey Clark cooperates, well, then you get a whole different set of statements and a set of information about his conversations with 
Donald Trump, with Scott Perry, with Mark Meadows, and maybe John Eastman. And then you've got, you know, a potential charge against John Eastman. And then he cooperates. You know, these things, that's how mob cases, that's how I used to, you know, I was an organized crime prosecutor. That's how we would make these mob cases. And I ended up, you know, charging and convicting the boss of the Genovese crime family because we worked our way up from, you know, an associate to a sol- to a soldier to a capo, you know, on up to the boss. And that's that's how it's done. And, you know, when you get to have a search warrant executed at your home, you know you're in the crosshairs. And the best thing for Jeffrey Clark to do would be to go cooperate early. You get as much benefit from your cooperation as anyone could because you haven't even been charged yet. And you may be able to stay out of jail if you cooperate. And he would be, I think, a really good witness. (laughs) This will be fun to watch, I guess. I'm hoping. Yeah. I mean, these have been, in a way, fun uh, just because, and in some cases, hilarious. I love Giuliani uh, leaving messages with state legislators who've told him not to call. Don't call me. And then he leaves I mean, a message. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just surprised that he actually left a message for the person that he intended to call. Unlike when he left a message for Tommy Tuberville on Mike Lee's phone. Remember that? Yeah, he might have been. What time of day was that? Yeah, yeah, that was like 7 p.m., I think. Oh, that's a little, like, start. <laughs> I don't know when he starts drinking. <laughs> hey, that's a, a serious disease, and I, um, pray, I'm praying for him. You know, it's, uh, and it's I, a program no of, <laughs> it's, um, you know, uh, the whole thing about AA is being honest is honesty. <laughs> So maybe if he gets in, and uh, that'd be fun. Al, didn't you love that Ru- Rudy Giuliani issued a statement after the first hearing denying the only thing he denied was that he was drunk. He didn't deny any of the substantive things that he said. He didn't deny that he said, just go and and declare that you won the election. He's fully on board with that. <laughs> he just denied that he was drunk. Right. But you know what? He was drunk when he denied it. <laughs> so you so got to cut count? him some does slack. It count? Does it count if you issue a denial of being drunk while you're drunk? Um, I think that's going to be part of what he pleads. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was drunk when I said I wasn't drunk. I, I mean, it's uh, amazing uh, to watch that. And you know, uh, Mark Elias has been on this podcast a lot, and he has some great stories from these uh, sixty what two cases, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where I mean, Giuliani is so out of his depth. I, I will say the 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 only thing that upsets me about watching the sort of you know deterioration of Rudy Giuliani is that he was the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of New York, where I worked for ten years. And he has indirectly sullying the reputation of that venerable office with this just, just absolutely horrific lawyering. I think directly. So, uh, so I mean, <laughs> what Elias said, there was one point there was a uh, the, the judge asks uh, Giuliani, what level of scrutiny are we apl- uh, you're asking to apply here? And uh, Giuliani just was blanking and just said, uh, the usual, yeah. <laughs> the, the usual. <laughs> Holy moly. That. Yeah. Yeah. That. That's, uh, that's amazing. So at least there's a uh, comedy here, which is, uh, a, an interest of mine. And thank yeah. you, uh, for joining us. I know that, uh, people should know how, inconvenient this was <laughs> for you today and i really appreciate that so no it's my pleasure look i i am a, a huge fan of yours i i have been for a really long time uh i was really disappointed that uh you ended up leaving the senate i think you were a fabulous senator and you know you're you're one of the people i think a lot about now that i'm in my own congressional campaign. Oh, that's right. Tell me about your district. Where are you running? I'm running in the new 10th district in uh, New York, which is lower Manhattan. Oh, okay. And, uh, and Brooklyn. It is at this point, probably 
best known for two things. One is having 15 candidates. And mm-hmm. the other is that uh, one of them is Bill de Blasio. Uh, um, but, you know, when we, we talk, we watch these January 6 hearings and we see how close we came to losing our democratic elections. And then we discuss what's going on today and how it is actually getting worse, not better since January 6th. And, you know, for somebody who was on the front lines uh, fighting for democracy during the impeachment investigation and fighting for a constitution, it, you know, it's something very much ingrained in me. And and I decided when there was an open seat in my home district that I was going to jump in to see if I could you know, if, if I could represent New Yorkers and also make sure that uh, our democracy is defended in, in Washington, because, you know, unlike anything we've ever seen in 200, you know, since the revolution, uh, it's really under attack. Well, uh, you have my endorsement. I'm endorsing you right now. And of course, Thank that was you. that was a deal to get you on the podcast. <laughs> it, it, are you having fun? Isn't it great talking to folks and meeting everybody? Isn't that the best? That, that is the best? the best part. That That's is the best. far and away the best part. Actually getting to me, you know, I, I had the honor of representing Minnesota for eight and a half years and meeting, you know, you learn so much meeting folks and you learn that people are great. And you know what else you learn that I've really been impressed by and proud of? There are so many, you know, everyday citizens who are really engaged in the the democratic process on a very very local level and as i've been going around the district i'm amazed at how many people are really committed to issues that affect them on a daily base basis they get no publicity for it they get no payment for it it takes up time and yet they're still really really invested and committed and it's what makes our democracy great and so it has given me a lot more, um, you know, it's given me a lot more hope for our democracy that it will ultimately win out over this authoritarian scourge in the Republican Party. It's a, it's a, it's a fight. And uh, it's, I, I, you know, there's maybe an enthusiasm gap uh, in the, you know, coming up in the midterm. Uh, I would hope that these hearings are helping, uh, helping uh, motivating folks. And I think, of course, the, the uh, Dobbs decision will and some other decisions by the court. But yeah, my listeners, you do that stuff, you know, work for yeah. somebody. Well, good luck in that. I hope, uh, I hope you're in Congress. That'd be great. What a great resource you'd be uh, in, in the House. And, well, thank you for that. Yeah. And uh, I hope you don't mind. I'll just be advertising your endorsement all over the place tomorrow. Uh, you got it. You got <laughs> I'm it. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week.